So welcome to the Women's Voices from Brazil online seminar today, which is on Maria Firmina dos Reis. So I don't know if Josefina Alvarez de Azevedo will not be uh, um, uh, talked about. We thought that these three writers and intellectual women of the 19th century will be presented today, and as well as Sueli Canero. The session is organized by Pedro Priglanitsky, who joined us now at the center, and also by Katrina Peixoto, who visited the center already in 2018, and is more or less really at the beginning of this great relation that has evolved between Brazil and the center here in old and small Parabon city. So the seminar on Brazilian women philosophers is organized, I said that already. This seminar, I call that thousand places in one world. And of course, I have an intention with that. And this intention we can discuss at the end. It is a collaboration of intercultural and intercontinental partners and aims to revive, to interpret, and to preserve the cultural and intellectual heritage of women. And it is a cooperation of my regular seminar here at the Paderborn University with that Intercontinental New Voices Seminar that is hosted at the Center for the History of Women Philosophers and Scientists, which is directed and organized this time by me. But this activity, New Voices, uh, Katrina and Pedro are parts of these New Voices activity. So the procedure I have already explained. Let me start to give you a short bio of the people who are talking about today, about Brazilian women today. Dr. Katarina Peixoto, who is assistant professor, now research fellow at the University of uh, uh, Virginia, comes from a grant of the Sao Paulo Research Foundation. She is a postdoc researcher at the Department of Philosophy at the University of Sao Paulo. And her main interest is retrieving women philosophers silenced by the canon. She started investigating and joining us in the research of the Western women philosophers, such as Emily de Chatelet, Mary Wollstonecraft, and others. And she organized together with Pedro a conference there. And then she, they started, and this is really very important now, to dedicate their endeavor also to the women philosophers from, from Brazil and from Latin America. I'm as, especially grateful also to Katrina, who came to the center in 2018 to celebrate with us the centenary of Elizabeth of Bohemia, who lived here by next to Parabon. And she edited then together also with Pedro, a book on women philosophers in Latin America. They also did something and started something as the center has launched the first, the really first encyclopedia of concise concepts ever on of taken from writings of women philosophers. She started uh, the translation activity and together with Pedro and others, they translated in our ECC more than 40 articles. Pedro Priglanitsky, who is now at the center, came to our knowledge through Katrina and worked with Katrina on the book, as I have said, and in very similar activities. He is now, he came now to the center and has taken the chance because there is a huge interest in Brazil also on Emily de Chatelet, who is really an important, very important philosopher. And the center, here in Paderborn is surely a leading institution in the digitization of the text of women philosophers. And for one year now, he will support our activities and hopefully continue in Brazil. 
Pedro holds a degree. Pedro Pritina is also a doctor. I should not suppress that. Pe Dr. Pedro Prigladnetsky holds a degree from the Federal University Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, where he completed also his master and his PhD in philosophy. He's specializing in early modern metaphysics and natural philosophy. He explores the perspectives of Descartes, Cavendish, and Du Chatelet. And his current research delves into the ideas of the 19th century Brazilian women thinkers. And he will talk about Josefina Alvarez de Azevedo. And now I hand over for 40 minutes or 45 minutes to Pedro and Katrina. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ruth, for the introduction. Thanks a lot of the warm welcome here in, at the center in these first few days. Uh, thanks for the invitation of organizing this panel, which is my first official talk here from the center and starting talking with my friend Katarina about this topic, Brazilian Women Philosophers. It's a great opportunity. So uh, our talk today, unfortunately, we had an order guest, which is Alina Leal, which could, couldn't make today. So we made some arrangements. And first of all, I'll make a general introduction uh, so some topics that regarding women philosophers from Brazil, especially uh, especially in the 19th century, then I uh, then Catarina will talk about Marina Firmina dos Reis, and then I'll conclude talk a little bit on Josefina Alvarez dos Reis. Okay, uh, I'm gonna share my screen. How can I do here? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 Pedro. Hi, Pedro. Hi. That's nothing. Should I do that? Do you have your cell phone? I think so. Oh. It's full screen, the PowerPoint, the presentation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, concern of the Brazilian philosophical academia with the history of Brazilian philosophy is recent. Indeed, there has been a certain controversy regarding the appropriateness of using the term Brazilian philosophy. That is, whether there is indeed a philosophical identity specific to Brazil. A notable segment of the Brazilian philosophical community holds the perspective that Brazil lacks a philosophical tradition and awaits the emergence of an authentic Brazilian philosophy and philosophers. This viewpoint has led certain historians of Brazilian philosophy to assert the following arguments. One, None of the thinkers from the colonial period and from the 19th century in Brazil can be appropriately labeled as philosophers. Two, these thinkers are merely enthusiasts who develop philosophies secondhand and are not deserving of serious consideration. Three, these secondhand philosophies lack a coherent serialization of ideas. And four, the best philosophical expression that we can find in Brazil is the commentary of classical texts. Examples of histories of philosophy from Brazil, of Brazilian around the late 19th century and early 20th century are these ones. Afrânio Coutinho, Cruz Costa, Isidro Romero, in their respective works on Brazilian history and Brazilian history of philosophy and history of ideas, share this negative perspective around uh, Brazil's, Brazil's philosophical identity, okay? We have to pay attention for the fact that the Brazilian academia is a phenomenon of the 20th century, with its professionalization and institutionalization reflecting a significant surge in philosophical research in the last decades of the 20th century. In this context, it is in recent years that we find a more, more pronounced 
emphasis on in-depth research dedicated to the national philosophical produ production throughout Brazilian history. Notable examples include Paulo Margucci, História da Filosofia do Brasil, or History of uh, Brazilian Philosophy, e Ivan Domingues, Filosofia no Brasil, Legados e Perspectivas, which can philosophy in Brazil, legacies and perspectives. There is, even in this recent effort to have a serious and more profound look on Brazil's history uh, and Brazil's uh, philosophy at the, at the 18 and most likely 19th century, we have the absence of women. We have a significant gap. Despite the efforts to produce this more detailed, we have this kind, we still have these questions to answer. What role did Brazilian women philosophers play in this history? Why do the history books on the country philosophy still feature a very small number of women authors in their chapters? Regarding that, we must realize some challenges faced by Brazilian women philosophers, which I point here. Uh, Underrepresentation in academic, curricula, and intellectual, intellectual discourses. Also, barriers to reaching the top of the academic career in philosophy. Women in Brazil have a two and a half times smaller chance that men are reaching the top of the academic career in philosophy. This is, was the result uh, of a very large study conducted by Professor Carolina Araújo and concluded in 2019. Professor Carolina Araújo is a professor in Brazil at the University, uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So changing the landscape, there is a growing interest and in production of high quality works concerning the philosophical production and thought of Brazilian women. Now, I will mention some colleagues, some Brazilian colleagues and researchers that work on that topic. There's others, I'll just mention a few. Nastasia uh, Pugliese, Carolina Araújo, Michele Schaeser, Seixas, Gisele Sip, Yara Frateschi, Katrina Peixoto, that's here with me today, Neusi, Kistemacher Welter, Alina Leal, that should be here but couldn't, unfortunately, and Rita Machado, among many others. So, the exclusion. Well, why? The reasons we should, uh, the reasons that were presented in the past for the exclusion. Uh, you should understand them to uh, look for a way out, to look at the from the arguments, to look to present a counter argument. So, it's not justifiable to consider as a foundation milestones of philosophy in Brazil these topics or these perspectives the connection of the Brazilian production with the academic output of European universities around the 16th century, the participation in Jesuit seminars and schools, which happened in Brazil from the 17th throughout the 18th centuries, which made which major impact on the, uh, and in the colonial period, the attendance in law schools, involvement in academic discourse of the few higher education institutions at the, in the 19th century. These are exclusionary milestones. It becomes, it becomes initially impossible to regard the works published by women if consider philosophy in Brazil only produced around these perspectives. We have to question why, why we should consider these perspectives the better perspectives or the only perspectives to regard the work of women, women philosophers or women in Brazil. So they are excluded by the demarcation criterion, not to the lack of philosophical interest in what they produced or failed to produce. This demarcation criterion was noted very clearly by Professor Nastasia Pugliese on her work of 2022 about a sketch of a history of, of women philosophers in Brazil. Both here. If you consider philosophy as a rational effort of constructing and reconstructing fundamental questions, it makes no sense to confine the narrative of its history 
to the experience of a singular and extremely restricted group. When we conceive philosophy as a rational ex exercise, folks who focus on constructing views and models of interpretation of the world in its multiple aspects, stating that women practice philosophy should not be a polemical question. So when you pay attention to what happened in 19th century Brazil after the colony, the, the colony, the colon, the colony period uh, ended, so the post-colonial Brazil, we can see a movement driven by women engaged in philosophical and literary endeavors dedicated to advocating women's rights gained force. So we have a list, it's a preliminary list. We have many other women that could be uh, joined this collection of names, but we still have already have this kind of representation. So we have Teresa Margarida Silvia Orta, Ana de Barandas, Nízia Floresta, Ana Luisa de Azevedo e Castro, Francisca Diniz, Maria Firmina dos Reis, that will shortly uh, be represented by, by the talk of Catarina, Josefina Alves de Azevedo, that will, re, that will present uh, a very short introduction late today, and Emilia de Freitas, for, the, for example. A short moment, uh, uh, Pedro. Maybe the, okay. the Violetta, may you have a look on the presentation? Yeah. Is it frozen or is it... Uh, is, it moving now? is it moving now? What What can we see? We still see the names of the 21st century researchers. Yeah. Violetta, can you have an eye on that? Because we are working with Violetta's... Uh, Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now it's better? Yeah. Okay. So this research uh, around the 19th century women thinkers from Brazil aims both to present and analyze their perspectives, the developmental context that shaped their works, the methods they employed, the extent to which the Brazilian women's quest and feminist press provides insights into envisioning a Brazilian Terrell de Femme as a central component of the Brazilian Enlightenment. The conclusion that we can make from the start, that this uh, as a hypothesis, is that philosophy can be crafted in many places in the most diverse circumstances. The manifestations of philosophy, therefore, are not confined to scientific treatises, principles, commentaries, or methods and manuals. They also encompass fiction, fantastic literature, literature, novels, manifestos, pamphlets, newspaper articles, and diaries. The questions that we should make throughout this research are, for example, what were the openings subversions and acts of rebellion necessary for women to publish her philosophical thesis in 19th century Brazil? What modifications do we need to make to ensure that we do not once again exclude women hindered as authors of intellectual philosophical future? How can we narrate the history of Brazilian women's contributions without considering them as homogeneous group and without disregarding them, their, their voices, the voices of other minorities. So with these questions in mind, we, shall, we should look at this series of these uh, authors from the 19th century. So uh, now I want to invite uh, my colleague and friend Catarina to talk to us a little bit about Marina Firmina dos Reis. Yeah. No, I just want to... Oh, hello. Um, just... Thank you very much for the invitation Sorry. and the presentation. Um, I'm, I'm starting to talk, I will talk about uh, Maria Firmina dos Reis. Uh, 
it is a work in progress. Uh, she was a figure of highly importance uh, in that time. I'm sharing my presentation as a text. Uh, it is a collection of observations from a paper that will be published and the next volume of the, the third edition of the Voices of Human uh, Philosophers in the History, uh, which will be edited by Professor Nastasha Pugliesi and Gisele Seco. And it will be published in the next month, uh, next month, I believe, but also two other texts. But before that, I will present you to this wonderful figure and a unique uh, character, uh, which was Maria Firmina dos Reis. She was a writer, a poet, a composer. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. She was a writer, a composer, an educator from Maranhão, probably of a mulatto origin, which means uh, she was a mix between white and black. Uh, the exact origin of Firmina with respect to the family nucleus is not yet clear. It is known that she was born in May, March 11, 1822, and it was recorded, and she was recorded on October 11, recorded, registered, uh, and 11, uh, December 21, uh, 25 that her parents were not married and, and her mom was a, a former slave. According to José Nascimento de Moraes Filho, the biographer who rescued Firmina's work in 1975 in the last century, Leonor Filipa dos Reis, which was her mom, would be white from the earth or white, while Firmina's father would be black. Today, this, this, this considering is otherwise. Her father would be white and her mom would be black, a former slaver. The Reis family would have, would have a certain reputation, the village of Guimarães, and the researcher Mundinha de Araújo, as recorded by Maria Helena Machado, found documents proving that Filipa dos Reis was actually a freed mulatto, black freed slave, former slave of Caetano José de Teixeira. This finding may challenge the grasp, the, the bond of between Firmina's mother and Reis family from Guimarães. When Firmina was five years old, her mom placed her in care of her sister in a house where Firmina grew up and became apparently self-taught, surrounded by a slavery context. What is certain is that, is that her mother's family was of African descent and her mother was a former slave. There are no images or portraits of Femina, probably due to the disenfranchisement of black women of the, by, the, by that time, and also to Firmina's reputation of shyness and discretion. The research and records of her upbringing are not well documented. What we know is that she ran from the first pedagogical experiment of mixed and free school in Brazil after the, her retirement from the public service as a teacher. She, she died blind and poor in 1917. Her exposure to a library or an educational training is not yet clear. It is known that Maria Firmina was a teacher of first letters and founded the first experience of a mixed color school in Brazil, whose pioneering was censored and the school after all closed just two years after it was founded. She had a distinguished career as a public intellectual, poet, composer, and novelist. 
she contributed to the cultural life of San Luis of the state of Maranhão, writing for newspapers. Studies on the author's story and intellectual formation have been flourishing in recent years, based on the pioneer work of Nascimento Moraes Filho in 1975. Through characters, the author observes in an unprecedented way in the history of Brazil, the subjective dimension and social awareness. The contest. Firmino was born in the year in which the independence of Brazil was proclaimed, which in several aspects was different from the independence process in the Spanish America. In Brazil, the Portuguese royal family remained in charge and slavery would take more than 60 years to be abolished. Instead of a Creole or mestizo elite, Brazil chose to preserve a white elite and import impoverished white population from what would become Northern Italy and Pomerania, Germany in the end of, by the end of the 19th century. The process of social exclusion went hand in hand with negotiations to end slavery. The economy and political life of monoculture for export, which would also be called plantation, guaranteed a certain stability to the agrarian paradigm of development with high levels of social and economic inequality. And along this path, they strengthened of local poverty slaveholders elites. In this context, the city in which Firmina was born and where she published her work gained prominence in the transition from the 18th to the 19th century with the advancement of the cotton production, the white gold, to the industrialized north of the U United States and Europe. With growing tension between the north and south of the United States, the demand for cotton from Maranhão and Ceará has increased and São Luis, capital of Maranhão, is, port, is a port in the equatorial city that helps to explain the formation of a local elite that followed Euro European translations, publications and debates um, almost at the very ta same time they are taking place in the, in the, where they were originally published. There were newspapers and bookstores and abolitionist circles in the capital. And there is therefore at least intuitive to consider some influence of that contest in her intellectual life and vice versa. Some of her narrative devices also corroborate the, the hypothesis that the writer was tuned to the state of the art in the literature and politics in the world. By the time Fermin started to write, there was already a literature in the making in the wake of the independence process and the Republican rebellion in the region where she lived. The formation of a national state was still uncertain within its borders. However, there was already an embryonic public sphere among the elite of San Luis do Maranhão. In the 13th century, today, in our days, from a woman trained within the family, a teacher of the primary school in the public system, black in the Brazilian Northeast, the expectation of becoming a writer is in many ways dizzying. The exercise of imagination and commitment to reconstruct Firmina's philosophical thought, therefore, cannot underestimate these conditions. Below, I will present some, some elements that can lead us to think about how the writer presented her claims on freedom and gender equality in three of her texts. The first one, which is the more dense one, Ursula in 1869, which inaugurates the abolitionist uh, literature, uh, Gil Peva in eight, from 1861, not three, and they slave, emphasizing Ursula, the most dense of them. Ursula. Uh, Fermina is uh, and the history of the abolitionist novel in Brazil. Fermina is placed by the literature, literary studies in contrast to the literary paradigm of Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was introduced to Portuguese speakers only one year after its release. 
in a different approach to that of Bishop Stowe's abolitionism, which is marked by the moral and religious indexation of the slave. Accordingly, Uncle Tom would have been good and happy in slavery compared to, to his to his uh, lot of that uh, jot of that of Joseph of Egypt and precious to the master himself, his honor. This is a perspective according to which abolitionists were a mirror of the slavocratic perspective, which denies the humanity of those who enslave, as, uh, as if uh, uh, those who are enslaved, as it, as it conditions to the face of the dignity through abolition to, Christ, to Christian morality. The hallmark of pre-Ursula, of the, the, the period uh, of that precede Ursula, is bounded by two kinds of dehumanization of the enslaved, the, the enslaved people. The enslaved would be or an absolutely victim, incapable of action or accountability, or would be, I quote, a possessor of a dysfunctional character and personality produced by the misery of the system and quotation, it is Haberly, 1972. In this literature, the problem of slavery falls over, as noted by Machado, on enslaved people, in such a way that slavery remains alien and unaccountable with the enslaved and why the enslaved people lack subjectivity. Abolitionist literature came to light in the same year in Brazil in 1869 with Luiz Gama and Maria Firmina dos Reis. What characterizes it is the condemnation of slavery as such, without limiting the denunciation in the mirror and effects on slaves. In Luis Gama's text, the moral denunciation of the slave society in Getulino's first Bruselec ballads, in which the author satirizes racism. In Ursula, two ruptures occur in two different, entirely new narratives. First, enslaved people are equal and their equality is marked by the determination of a common ground, nature. As Martin observes in Ursula, black people are endowed with their own mental pattern within the scenario of the new world, end quotation. This is, we will see the setting for histority in Fermina's abolitionism. In Ursula, the voice of enslaved people does not require any confessional nuance to determine equality. This is a fact of nature as opposed to slavery, which is defined as unnatural and therefore violent and unfair. Under the cloak of a romantic prose, characteristic of a post-colonial Brazil, uh, and influenced by neoclassical landscaping with no clear intrinsic value, slavery is presented as the foundational horror of all the evils caused by mankind. In Ursula, the stereotype of the slave disappears, while the natural dignity that confers equality between men and women is not now anchored in the maternal role in foreign land, which is Africa. This function, in turn, depends on a nomas onomastic denotation in referential use. Firmina's abolitionism is characterized by the coextension between nature and freedom and by the use of proper names as condition for the establishment of a historicity. Firmina justifies the signature of the novel as a woman from, a woman from Maranhão, that is to say, as an indefinite description through which she presents a perspective. This woman would be almost illiterate, less liberal than she ought to be, less cultured, and has produced a shy work because she would have no gifts from nature. However, with this non-signature of this work, she intends to have opened a path to be followed. 
Anonymity is a common expedient of self-protection against censorship, but there is no record so far that Firmina has suffered editorial censorship and that anonymity was a choice before some external constraints to her work. In contrast, the claim of a signature based on a positional and general denotation, a woman from Mariam, is consistent with the nature of what is narrated. It is from this observation that I intend to explore the metaphysical landscape that has been introduced to us, that has been introduced to us uh, in her narrative. Uh, by metaphysical landscape, I mean this, the narrative of an exuberant and untouched landscape, which seems to be at once alien to a human action and without intrinsic value. The value is introduced, introduced not with the mere entry on and scene of a human character, the young Tancredo, which appears unconscious, and by Tullio, a young slave who meets Tancredo and saved his life. I will, I will uh, advance the, the story, which is, and the, the, the two novels, both uh, Ursula and Gupeva, are novels of a triangle, uh, a, a love triangle, full of, full of a plate of uh, imped impeditions and interdictions uh, 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 following the society rules. Uh, as love as democratic society, right, and colonial society in a way. Uh, and, but um, in both of them, she displays and discharges semantic operators to to convey her views on abolitionism and freedom. In both of them, she uses names to describe contexts and situations. First of all. There, is, there are no family names, which is still nowadays a very important threat of Brazilian society. She treats everyone by the, by the, by the single names, which means, by means of which she, she conveys a treatment of an intellectual and individual and mental life. And that is unprecedented. Second, she uses that to put her voice on a narrative with respect in referring to Africa as a past, as a past where everyone, everyone who is now enslaved in Brazil were free. That is also unprecedented. Third, the role of transmission and memory is at the responsibility of the motherhood. It is as if there, uh, it is as if at the same time, Africa and motherhood were a sort of the same, the same, the same thing, the same structure, which conveys a possibility to, to underpin a, a new narrative, a new history for these people and for the, all the people in so far slavery is not natural and freedom is natural and, and finally what i say is that by no and she does that also no indexing not she does not uh, oblige or confines the subjectivity to religion. That means that means a lot still today because the the black people oh, and the then enslaved should not be considered Catholics or Christians in order to be dignified and to be respected. Um, and also, I'd like to talk about a bit about Gupeva and about the slave, which, which is, if I'm not wrong, the last, the, her last work. Gupeva is a story of uh, an indigenous man who, may, who, was, who, is, who became a widow, and her, uh, his wife was called Epic. 
they both had a, a girl, a child. The, the, name is, the child's name is also Epic. And in the story, uh, by a sort of accident, the father, without knowing, be, falls in love with Epic, the daughter. Of course, he became aware of that, and there is an tradition of this love. It is a forbidden love. This is Brazilian romanticism. That is to say uh, that she makes an operation again of transmission and memory through motherhood. It is as if she was say, talking to us or saying to us that uh, the gender oppression is transmissible. It goes from mom to, to, the, to the daughters and the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the man, regardless the or of the man, the oppression is always there. This is a very radical move. And lastly, the, her last uh, 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 work is The Slave. It's a story of a former uh, uh, freed slave that becomes, he, he, she is re-enslaved. And by the end of a painful life, she is freed again. And someone is started to talk about her life and she says that she will talk about her life. She herself claim her voice. So there is a movement inside her literature of a semantic uh, nature, which is very sophisticated, very attuned to the modern path that it, there was undergoing at the same time, almost at the same time in Europe. And so that makes her uh, a very different uh, person, a unique person. She was just, just to finish, uh, she was uh, a, sophisticated, uh, a sophisticated abolitionist writer, daughter of a slave, who used modern semantic operations in her work through which she conveyed consistent and radical positions in defense of abolition, gender equality, and motherhood as functions of a distinct narrative. Everything about Firmina seems promising to the philosophical eye today. She is a black woman from a very poor region in Brazil that works hard to make a lot of things that we are, for which we are still fighting and thinking about today. And we have not even an image, an iconog iconography, a uh, way to reconfigure our visual of her. Uh, but we are starting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Catarina for this talk about Maria Firmina and start this conversation. I'm sure you will proceed and we've done many other discussions from that. And now I'll give a very uh, short introduction on Josefina and why I think she's important as well through in the 19th century landscape. Let me, okay, okay. yeah. Sorry. Um, oh. Yeah. How? Uh, sorry for uh, questioning. How are we proceeding? I thought that you are still adding a few words on Josefina Alvarez. Yes. Yes. Just a technical thing here. Yeah. And now... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. You. Yeah. Wonderful. So, 
Josefina Alvarez de Azevedo, also from the 19th century. Uh, her, her work was a little bit posterior than uh, the novels of Maria Firmina. And to talk about Josefina is to talk about uh, a movement that happened in Brazil in the 19th century around the periodicals and pamphlets and uh, newspapers. So Constancia Lima Duarte, which is a uh, historian from this Brazilian and uh, literature from this Brazil, Brazil's period, have recorded 143 different newspapers and magazines that circulated throughout the country uh, with the topics or around topics about women or feminism. And, and this kind of configures a war of pamphlets between this literature and the, the literature from exclusion. So, so the main literature uh, towards the exclusion and the milestones of the exclusion and demarcation of the participation of women. So one of the most important uh, periodicals of this time was edited by Josefina, which was called A Familia or uh, The Family. Uh, around 1888 throughout 1897 from the cities of Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, uh, two of, of the biggest cities in Brazil. In this journal, we can see a combative tone in favor of women's emancipation. Oh. The role that Josefina Alvarez de Azevedo plays on that context, and she conducted an intense feminist activism with the, within the pages of a family. She protested against male insensitivity in refusing to recognize women's rights. She anticipates as well the denunciation of the female gender as an ideolog ideological construction based on bad physiology, and bad science, and demands radical changes in society. She also uh, used the drama, the, the playwright, the structure of the theater to convey her activism. So she also th you can think of her as a performative philosophy. She turned the theatrical stage into a locus for political engagement, Utilizing it as a space for reflection on the social status of women, another method of disseminating, disseminating feminism and promoting the fight for rights. The major works of Josefina can be seen and the, the collection of A Familia, the newspaper from 1888 throughout 1997, The Feminine Vote, the Vote Feminine, The Modern Woman, a Mulher Moderna, from 1990, 1991, and uh, Galeria Illustri and Illustrated Gallery, which is a collection of, of uh, brilliant women throughout history. The Modern Woman is a compilation of texts and a, prof a, a, a deeper uh, analysis from what you have around the familia. Just to give a, a quotation here. From the first volume of A Familia, I'm quoting the editorial note of Josephine around the middle of the paragraph. Universal, universal consciousness sleeps over a great centuries old injustice the enslavement of women. Until today, men have clung to the false and harmful principle of our inferiority. But we are not inferior to them because we are their equals, albeit of a different gender. We have, according to our nature, specific functions, just as they do for the same reason. However, this is not a reason to, for inferiority because that brings the animal into the natural scale of its abilities. Therefore, in everything, 
we must compete with men, the governments in governance of the family, as well as in the direction of the state. So that's just to see the tone of the, this periodical. The collection called The Modern Women, we have the, the, the right to vote, which is comprised of five essays, texts related to female education. So yes, uh, texts related to ac universal access to education, some poems, a critical analysis of a, a playwright called The Doctor, which is uh, presents that try to present the impossibility to be a woman that that, she, that is a doctor as well. Conclude the importance that of studying Josephina's work. Contribution to feminism. She was a central figure in the Brazilian feminist movement of the 19th century. Multifaceted engagement, her work encompassed various forms of ex expression, which is uh, coherent with the view that uh, Brazilian philosophy from the 19th century uh, are presented in a diverse styles and forms, historical and social context. Her works reflect not only the struggles of women, but also the social, political, and cultural dynamics of Brazilian society in the 1800s. Rescuing Forgetting Voices. Studying human philosophers and thinkers is a way to rescue voices that have, have often been neglected or forgotten throughout history. Influence on current debates. Josefina's legacies can inspire critical reflections on contemporary issues. So this is a very short introduction uh, just to give an uh, impression of Josefina works and who she was and her importance and I, we can proceed for to the discussion. Mm -hmm.